Okay, so um, I just want to go through our usual routine or the routine I always go through of, um, let me just close my window. I just want to go through our routine of just quickly revisiting what we've learned so far, just to remind people to bring that into, um, you know, all of the pre bring all of the previous lessons into um, the lesson we're doing today, or or what we're the object we're going to be drawing today. So we started with perspective and talked about the some of the basic elements of perspective. And we moved on to applying perspective to a simple still life. Slowly making our objects we're drawing more complex and understanding perspective and perspective as it applies to organic and more complex objects and thinking about how we can interpret complex objects in relationship to or thinking about Un sim simple underlying geometry. We talked about light and shadow or, or we, introdu we introduced light and shadow and the elements of light and shadow are going to be important to us for the rest of the semester. And we're going to be thinking about making a drawing where we use them talking about the elements of light and shadow today. So just as a reminder, Again, so that we can emphasize this so that we're all uh, using the same language. Light, the elements of light and shadow that concern us are the light mass and the shadow mass. The terminator, which is the division between the light and the shadow, the point on the form where the object turns from light into shadow. Within the shadow mass, we will be looking for the core of the shadow Right, that darker band of shadow near the shadow edge, the reflected light, the, the, the illumination within the shadow side that happens because light reflects off of surfaces around the object, the cast shadow, the object or the, the shadow that's created by the object blocking light, occlusion shadows or shadow accents, the very darkest part of the shadow mass where absolutely no light reaches or virtually no light reaches. Half tone, that what the subtle tone that softens and transitions the shadow into the light, the center light, which is the main uh, local value that's revealed by the light source, and then the highlight. So we'll be um, looking for those elements, light and shadow on complex form. And we did our exercise where we started to render volumes looking for those elements of light and shadow. And then we revisited planar structure or at least revisited it in the sense that we took our understanding of planes and how we can represent them as moving through through space and started to think about how more complex forms could be interpreted as planar structures. Remember this Albrecht Dürer drawing where he's studying the structure of the human head according to planar structure, which is uh, taken from the Stephen Bauman video. And we did this in class drawing, uh, interpreting organic objects in, ter in terms of light, shadow, and planar form. So we're going to take all of those, um, all of that information we've learned so, so far and apply it to a very carefully rendered drawing. So when we're working in class, it, and when we're fortunate enough to be able to work, be working in studio, I have students do a drawing something like this. So uh, the, the, on the right, we're looking at a drawing that was done based on this plaster cast of an ancient sculpture. And so this, this plaster cast 
of an ancient sculpture is set up in the room and it's illuminated by a single light source coming from the upper right. And then I ask the artists to do a drawing where as much as possible, you make an exact optical illusion copy of what you're looking at. And uh, while for sure, most artists are not going to continue drawing like this, I think that doing a drawing like this is a useful exercise in terms of getting yourself to see not only shape and form and structure and value relationships, really carefully studying how to successfully see and record value relationships. Now, I mean, I don't, be freaked out about this drawing. Um, this is done by someone who's very advanced and I don't expect people to be able to do this kind of drawing. We're also, I'm also not gonna be pushing this. Um, I, I push, we, I do a drawing similar to this, although we use a drapery because we're at a much earlier stage in development than the artist who did this drawing was. This drawing, this artist had had many months or years of a very specific kind of study under their belt. Um, and we're not at that point. So we're, we do a simple drapery. Um, I, I'm not gonna be quite, um, because, the, because the conditions learning online are not optimum for this. Um, and, and also I guess, because maybe I'm modifying my approach a little bit. I think that this certainly has advantages doing a drawing like this but it has drawbacks too. Um, and so um, I think we'll be doing a, 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 today we'll be concentrating on a fully rendered drawing of a drapery. It's a drawing that I expect people to fully develop over two class sessions. So my expectation is that you put about seven hours into the drawing. And that's what we would do on campus in class. We would spend two full class sessions on the drawing. And we'll be doing a drawing, something like a Proudhon. So we're gonna do a fully rendered drawing, full development of lights and shadows, it, being conscious of planar structure and creating an undeniable palpable sense of the roundness and the fullness of a volume in space. We're gonna be doing um, the drawing with white and black charcoal on, on blue paper. So people should have that by now. It was part of the material list. Um, so we're gonna be doing a drapery, something more simple than this. This is a famous drapery study by Leonardo. Um, but we'll, we will be doing a fully rendered drapery. Again, more simple than this, because this just gets into a, a complexity that I think is this point in our class. Uh, but one thing I do want to point out about this drawing is it's fully rendered. The artist is fully conscious of you know, a, a full range of values from the lightest light to the darkest dark. But the artist is also very conscious of an absolute clarity of planar structure, right? So there is no, no mistaking our ability to move back backwards along that, that shelf-like plane that's created by the way the drapery is hanging here. And then we drop under, right, as the form goes into shadow, we roll around the complexities of the form. And then we come out on another shelf-like or ramp-like plane that's clearly, unmistakably moving in a specific direction in space. And then we turn the corner as that drapery rolls into shadow, right? So we see the, the plane of the drapery that's turned away from the light source um, move into shadow. We have the cast shadow. Notice also that the artist is doing a full rendering, primarily looking for those elements of light and shadow, right? Light mass, light mass, dark mass, light mass, dark mass, core of the shadow, reflected light, occlusion shadow, cast shadow, half tones. Um, in this drapery, the half tone not only turns the shadow into the light, also the half tone is used to indicate these small variations on the form. So we're gonna be seeing if we can fully develop a drawing 
along these lines where we're gonna be paying careful attention to not only getting the values of the shadows, but also the values of the lights, um, a kind of modified version of this laborious, um, carefully observed study. Just another example, this is by an artist, an unknown artist, or at least I don't know the, who the artist is, although I could probably find out the little signature down there, I think. Um, I anyway, when I found the image, didn't find it with an artist's name attached. But so again, a, a fully developed rendering of a draped room where we are full, completely aware of, or where the artist has carefully communicated to us, not only the full range of values and a believable sense of a drapery actually of a specific drapery observed by the artist, but um, clearly at the same time communicating to us um, the a clarity of planar structure, right? A clarity of, of the, the light and shadow revealing not just gradations of tone, but, diff, but planes on an object moving in different directions because they are oriented in different ways in relationship to the light source. So those planes that are more that are, that are closer to being parallel to the light source are illuminated. Those planes that are turned away from the light source go into shadow. The transitional planes are in half tone. So we're going to be doing a careful study where we look for all of those elements, um, all of those elements of light and shadow. Okay, so I have my setup here. Now let me just show you um, before. So before um, I talk, before I start the demo, let me just show you the materials that I have. So hopefully people have, have received these materials. We have these, um, these soft drawing knives. We have um, the, um, the pads for the drawing knives. I apologize for that very the poor quality of this camera. It's frustrating. Um, I believe you have some that came with the um, that came with the knife. So I'm going to put these on. I'll be inserting these on each of the knives. And then we have the, the white and the black charcoal, charcoal pencils. And then we have these, what are called pan pastels. So they're little containers of white and black pastel. So this is a drawing technique that starts to, uh, it's almost a kind of painting. Um, so I think it's a good transition. It's a good thing to learn. One thing I forgot to put out was I always have a piece of paper towel. And the reason I do that is when I'm, so what we're going to do, we won't be doing this right away, but what we're going to be doing is we're going to be blocking in um, large masses of tone um, by, by tapping or dipping, that's a little bit of an overstatement, tapping the drawing tool in the pan pastel and then blocking in big masses of tone with that. So I like to, when I'm doing this, I like to get some pastel on the um, drawing knife and then pat it up, pat a little bit of it off, so I have a little bit more control of it. Anyway, we'll be doing that in a few minutes. 
So can I answer any questions about those materials? Um, what is the, the, the covers called? What do you call them? The what? The covers? Oh, the covers they're just the pads that come with it. Um, you know, uh, this is, these materials are relatively new to me. Um, I think they just call them the pad. The, I think this is called the soft knife, S-O-F-F-T. Okay. And they're, they're just the pads that come with them. Oh, okay, okay. Um, okay, so does everybody have those? Yes. No. Okay, so you're gonna to need to get them. Those are on the materials list. And these these are not these are not um, expensive. Um, you know, you, you can get them by going to a Blick. You know, they're gonna have them. Uh, the Carl Place store doesn't actually have them in stock. Just so that you know. Yeah, I, I ordered it. I, I had I had ordered it in advance, but that was one of the items that they didn't have in store. So I had a I have it now, but it wasn't there. So if anyone's looking, don't go to Carl Place. Okay, so I'm gonna start my drawing. Uh, the way I start all drawings, um, just with uh, just with my pencil. So I'm using um, again. I'm using my I'm using the charcoal pencil, and I, I sharpen it the same way. And I, I believe people have the HB and the B. Um, I would start with an HB pencil. And um, you want to, um, you know, I, I don't, I actually don't remember if I went over the way to hold the drawing pencil. I normally, I always do that first class. Um, no, I think you did. I did. Okay. Yeah. You said use your wrist, right? Yeah. You don't know. You don't want to use your, you want to use your shoulder. Oh, okay. okay. And try to hold the pencil like I'm holding it here. Don't hold it like we are, you know, trained to do in school to make letters and that kind of thing. We're doing something totally different. And, and one of the reasons you want to hold it like this is it allows you to have a lighter touch. And you're going to want a light, a light touch in doing this drawing because you don't want to put down too heavy a mark. If you put down too heavy a mark it's, it, with charcoal, it's even harder to erase than graphite. So try to make a very light mark. And um, what's the other thing I was gonna say? Oh, on your paper, the paper that um, I asked you to buy, you're gonna notice that one side of it is, has a very rough, I would almost call it like a golf ball texture. And then the other side is more smooth. I would recommend using the smoother side for this drawing, even though because of the way they sometimes put a sticker on that drawing paper, the rougher side seems like it should be the main side, but I would recommend using the, um, use the smoother side for this drawing. So I'm going to, um, I'm gonna be using the same approach to drawing that we've used so far. I'm going to draw be drawing here I'm gonna do this relatively quickly um, just because I don't want, I don't want to um, take up a lot of your time. We've gone over this before. So I, I'm, I'm using the same kind of structural, uh, structural simplifying approach to laying in the laying in the drawing. I'm not paying any attention at all to little folds on the small, you know, little variations on, what am I trying to say here? 
I'm not paying any attention at all at this point to little, little bumps and hollows on the contour. So you'll notice on this drapery, there's a little bump there, and then there's a little uh, shallow area, then another little bump. Totally ignore those things. You don't want to get bogged down in those small details at this point. That's getting bought, you know, wasting time on those little things is something, you know, if nothing else, I want people to learn um, in what we're doing. So, I mean, learn from this class. Now, eventually we'll put those little things in, but those are not things you see at the beginning. What you see at the beginning is simply the large masses, right? The large shapes and the large masses. So I want to get point A to point B accurate and I don't want to be distracted by all of the little, um, little bumps and hollows on the way. Once I get point A and point B accurate, then all those little bumps and hollows just fall right in place. So I'm just looking at, again, the large masses of the form or the large shapes of the form. using a, a straight line, point to point on the contour approach. So on this, on this passage of wrinkles, I'm gonna go from point A to point B. I'm gonna set up that angle. I'm not gonna look at all those little um, variations on that, on that passage from A to B. So I'm just gonna get that angle accurate first. What's the angle from point A to point B? This, by the way, this, what, in, in a way by accident, this approach where I'm doing a drawing of the object right next to the object itself, so I can step back and, and make one-to-one -one comparisons. This is a technique some artists use. It's called sight size. <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not doing it in a sense, I'm not doing it by design um, in order to teach you this technique. I think that this technique limits, uh, if, if, if someone learns by doing this technique only, which there are some schools, some kind of classical schools that teach this way. They always have the student set, the up, set their drawing up visibly right next to what they're drawing so they can step back and make one-to-one -one comparisons. It does, it does let you see, see the relationship between what you're drawing and what you're looking at with a great deal of accuracy. Um, but it also, but then students tend to always need that situation in order to make a drawing. But I think that in general, comparative drawing, which is you know, the kind of observational drawing you do when you're at, in the studio at Queens College, that's a better way to learn. Um, this is, this is, uh, this setup here is just because of the way I have to teach to do these online demos. But even with the distortions of this camera, I think you can see how this kind of sight size approach um, allows you to make one-to-one -one comparisons. And I, you know, as a, as something to try, I don't think it's a bad idea as long as you don't rely on that in the end. So now just finding a little bit of the variations to the contour.
So now I, so I have A, B, A, B, I have that angle accurate. Now I can easily go in and just, you know, sort of bump in those variations to the contour. And, and they're surprisingly subtle, you know, I see that drapery roll around in space like a roller coaster, but the way the contour records that is surprisingly subtle. And again, remember, you want to try to keep your marks light. You want to you want to just have you know just enough of a touch so that you get a um, a discernible line, but you don't want to you know, be going be going in there and making a really heavy mark. So by the way, so with today's demo, I, I will be working the entire class session. Um, and then I will also continue working on this later today on my own. And I will, um, I'll post the demo we do in class. And then I'll also make another recording of the work I do on my own and I'll also post that so people can refer to that as I continue to develop the drawing. Um, now, today's session, because this is going to be, um, is gonna be a lot of sort of fine rendering, which I, I want everyone to do as a way of exploring this kind of very carefully rendered drawing. But, um, you know, there may be periods where I'm not talking because I've already explained what I'm going to be doing and I'm just doing it, just, you know, developing that aspect of the drawing. So, people can, at a, you know, at a certain point today, if you, if you want to sign off Get your, you know, get your materials together. Um, you know, start your setup, and then you can refer back to um, the recorded, um, the recorded video on Blackboard. That's fine because there are going to be points today where I'm just unavoidably doing this kind of drawing. I'm going to be polishing, and you know, I, I mean, it, it may get to a point where you, you, where it's not very useful for you to continue to watch me polish, um, and it may be best to, you know, watch the, you know, I, I would suggest watching at least half of the class today, how to get this started and then selectively refer to points in the recorded demonstration that will show you how to handle certain techniques, if that makes sense. You're welcome to watch, I mean, obviously, if people want to just stay online and watch the whole thing, um, you know, I obviously completely support that and even would encourage it. But if it gets to be a little bit tedious, um, you know, that, that's certainly acceptable. So I have, um, I think, a decent um, block in of the main shape of the drapery. Um, so now, just as we've done with all of the objects we're going to render, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to draw out the shadow shapes. So now let's look really carefully at this drapery and identify those elements of light and shadow. And I, again, apologize for my less than perfect camera quality. Um, that's 
tending to blow out some of these lights. Let me just, um, I'm gonna turn this off for one second. So that's the, uh, well, that blows it out too. Boys? Sorry, I, I, I just, I don't have a good camera. I wish I did. Luckily we're back on campus next semester. So um, nevertheless, we can see, we can see the main elements of light and shadow. You know, this, this part of the drapery here is blown out, right? It just turns into that kind of blinding light. But the fact is you don't, it's not like there's a lot of information in there anyway. And we can see the main elements of light and shadow. Okay, so let's identify those. So we have obviously the big planes of shadow, right? That big long, um, that long cone-like form. So um, again, in case I was far too far away, we have this long cone-like form. And let's think about the simple forms we drew, right? That, that left-hand form on the drapery is, is very similar to a cone, right? It, it's a kind of elongated version of a cone hanging from the point at the top where it's pinned. And we come down this long cone, right? And we rendered a cone in light and shadow. So in a way, this is going to be doing the same thing that we did um, with the cone we rendered. And in, for that matter, a, a variation on the form of an egg. So we have a light mass and then we have the dark mass. We have a, a long, narrow light mass and then this long finger-shaped or maybe flame-shaped dark mass. We again have a light mass and then, and then this narrow but nevertheless important shadow mass on the right side of the form. You always want to identify all of the shadow masses, no matter how large or how small. This is a relatively large shadow mass. You don't want to neglect the relatively narrow shadow masses because if we neglect these, if we don't draw them in there, it's not going to look, it's going to look like we don't have a form turning around in space. It's going to look like we have something that has like a paper thin edge. So we have light mass, dark mass, then very clearly visible core of the shadow, reflected light, cast shadow, cast shadow, core of the shadow, reflected light. We have the, this very dark occlusion shadow. We have the half tone rolling the, the shadow into the light. So we have the shadow edge here and then half tone where the shadow transitions into the light. Uh, we have a whole bunch of little half tones because of the wrinkles. I'm not gonna pay much attention to the wrinkles on that drapery um, just because, just in order to get as much done on this as I can. Um, now I wanna point out something here. Here, notice there, this from, from this point on the drapery to this point on the drapery, all of this in here is shadow. Right, because we have a, a volume facing the light and then the planes of that object turn away from the light and move backwards in space. And then as that plane flattens out along the surface of the drawing wall, that drapery turns back into the light source and, and it, and it um, is illuminated. Now there's a lot of, there, there are, there's a, a lot of variation in the values on the shadow. So from the, the core of the shadow to the reflected light, and then here what we might read as reflected light. But what actually is happening there, and the reason that it seems relatively light is there's light hitting the back side of that drapery and then passing through. So if I put my fingers here, notice I can put my finger and block the light and you can see my finger back there. You can see my finger blocking the light. 
So that's a situation where as an artist, I have to decide what I'm gonna do with that. Meaning that if I make too much out of that light value, that's a result of light passing through the drapery, my form in the drawing may not turn successfully. That may be too light to allow the drawing to read as if that volume is really turning around in space. So that may be a, something where I edit that light out. I deliberately avoid drawing those light areas um, so that I don't destroy the form I'm trying to create in the drawing um, or just minimize the value of those. But I'll, I'll talk more about that when um, I get into the actual drawing. Okay, so I'm now going to block in the shadow masses. So remember, I'm not, the shadow masses, everything from the terminator or the shadow edge to the cast shadows, the shadow mass. I'm not gonna make little separate areas for the core of the shadow, reflected light. I'm just blocking in the big shadow mass. So looking at, I'm, I'm using this line to trace out the shadow edge or that terminator, paying attention to how that, um, paying attention to the shape of the shadow pattern. And I'm looking at the proportion of or I'm looking at how much I how much light I see as opposed to how much shadow. And, and again, I want to emphasize because this is very important. I'm I'm ignoring at this point, I'm ignoring the reflected light. I'm just turning everything in the shadow area into one simplified shape. Now, when we get down into here, it gets a little bit more complicated. But so if you, so notice next to this little corner on the drapery, that's the edge of the shadow. And so I've drawn that here. Now I'm going to continue that line. I'm ignoring, I'm ignoring all those little wrinkles. Those can be brought in later. Again, I don't need to pay attention to um, all those little details. Those are relatively insignificant. And I'm just gonna trace out the, the perimeter of that shadow mass. So, On this form, the shadow goes from here On this form, the shadow ends there at that piece of tape. And the terminator is here and it continues up that form. And so I'm drawing, this shape I've drawn is from terminator to the end of the cast shadow. I'm, I'm not paying any attention to all at all to that detail in there. And the way to make a successful rendering in light and shadow is to first identify light mass, dark mass, in terms of absolute simplicity, ignoring all those little details that people, when they first start drawing, they love. They get much too attached to. They try to draw them all right away and they end up with a mess. Instead, I'm identifying the big shadow, big light mass, and then the big shadow mass entirely ignoring any of the little details within the shadow mass. You want to turn that into just the big average value of that shadow. So the same thing goes for 
this, this shadow here. So again, let's do that same thing with, with some tape. So that shadow, let's trace out that shadow. That shadow, here's the terminating light, and we have this narrow white mass. The shadow edge, that's down there. And then is my tape sticking? Yes, sort of. Whoops. Stay there. The shadow is about from there. That's the shadow edge. And then the end of the cash shadow. Okay, this isn't working out as well as I hoped, but and then the, the cash shadow is there. You can't see anything. Terminator or shadow edge, the end of the cash shadow. I'm just going to turn that into one. Big, narrow, but large and unified shadow area. Again, I'm not paying any attention at all to the little shapes within. So that's my shadow, the, the shadow edge on that shadow mass. But then it ends up about right about here and right about there. This is half tone. So I'm not gonna put that in as part of the shadow mass. This is shadow. So why do I know that's half tone? There's a value difference, right? This is the true dark where the form turns completely away from the light source. This is a, a plane that's oblique that's at an oblique angle to the light source, but not completely turned away. And now I'm going to draw the far right edge of the cast shadow. So that edge there. So where is that edge on my form? It's here. And then I have this long, you know, finger shaped, I don't know what, looks like a finger to me, or you know, it's a little bit like a long blade, something like that. It's this long, narrow cast shadow. And then that cast shadow is also on Fold of the drapery below it, like that. And then notice here we have the form shadow on this little bit of the drapery that's coming out below the larger one. So the form shadow here is this. Now people should be getting to the point. I, 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 I think we've talked about this enough. People should start now being able to see these different elements of light and shadow and bring them into the drawing, even if, you know, certainly it's going to be, you know, it, it, if this is a new approach to drawing, it may be awkward and hard to control them. 
but I want to see you all looking for those elements of light and shadow, all, all of those elements of light and shadow. So then we have this long, narrow shadow plane on the right hand side of the form. And it continues all the way up. And then, of course, we have our cast shadow. So something like this. where it exactly ends, it's a little bit unclear. Okay, so now I have um, the main, I have the main shape of my object and the cash and the shape of the cast shadow. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start blocking in the large masses of light and dark uh, with the pan pastel. So I'm not going to I'm not going to do what we've been doing so far, which is using the point of the of the drawing pencil to block in the masses of light and shadow. Although we could do that, that's just a different different kind of drawing, and it's more laborious. Um, you know, it gives a certain look that some people want to have in their drawings. Um, but we're just going to be trying this different approach. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to block in my darks. So again, I'm going to be using the pan pastel. I'm going to be taking my drawing knife and dipping it in the pastel. I'm going to pat off a little bit of that so that I don't have, so that's not too dark. And then I'm going to start massing in the shadows. So, um, you know, you want to just practice with this, your first, um, your first block ins may be a little bit messy. But I know some people here are painted. If, if any, for anybody who's painted, it's a little bit like painting. You also want with this tool to be um, You know, you want to be using a kind of light touch. Don't overdo it. Don't overdo.
don't overdo the pressure. I'm going to um, use my eraser to, re to remove some of the darker areas. Um, professor? Yeah. Are you doing any specific shading now or are you only blocking in like the dark mass, like awesome. the dark shadow? And then you're gonna like... I'm not, I'm okay. not paying any attention at all to variations within the dark mass. So I'm just blocking in one unified consistent value for the okay. dark Does that make sense? No, yeah, yeah. So then you can just work on it later. Right. So I'm just giving it a unified Unified value. Mm. And, uh, you know, insofar as paying attention to the value um, that I'm looking at. So I, I want to start this, I want to start approximating the values here, but I'm not doing any, I'm not doing any um, uh, uh, observing of of value transitions or anything like that. I'm just blocking in a simple, simple tone. Thank you. So, and if I block in, if, as I'm blocking in this simplified, unified tone, um, if I obscure my original contours, I can obviously just go back in and clean up, reestablish that contour. You know, this pan pastel erases nicely. So notice here, this is shadow mass and that's shadow mass underneath. So I'm treating it all as one unified shadow area. I'm not, um, I'm not trying to in, in effect color in the shadow between the lines. I'm just blocking in the totality of the shadow areas. So I'm just getting a pattern of lights and darks. Now, um, please, if anybody, if I'm doing, if because of my simplification, I'm doing anything that doesn't make sense to people as you're watching, please don't hesitate to let me know so I can further explain. So again, I'm just blocking in the big light and dark masses. And, and again, I, I'm repeating myself here, but just because I think it's worth emphasizing, I'm ignoring the subtle variations in the value within those larger shadow masses. I'm just looking at the big simplified shadow mass.
core of the shadow, the reflected light, half tones, that all I'm going to bring in later. Right now, I'm just very broadly walking in the big unified shadow mass. So in this area that I'm blocking in right now, I'm blocking in the totality of the shadow from the terminator on the form, all the way to this edge here of the cast shadow. So I'm treating that as, again, one unified shadow mass. Not searching out all those variations within it. So um, we good so far? Any questions about this? Because I know this is maybe simplifying things in a way that people aren't used to. Can I clarify anything about what I've just done? Okay. So, um, you know, again, about Professor? Yeah. Do you recommend um, blocking out the cast shadow along with the regular, like, you yeah, know, so shadows on the actual drapery? Yeah, just block it all, all in as one unified shadow mass. It's always good to be able to see what you're, what you're drawing or painting with that kind of unifying simplicity. Right. You'll end up with a much more, in the end, you'll end up with a much more unified appearing work of art if you get if you get into that habit if that makes sense mm. uh, okay so okay now uh, an important thing to emphasize when you start blocking in your white so i'm going to block in my whites i think you all just have one of these soft knives so you're going to need to to replace your pad when you block in the white. You don't want to block it in with the same pad. Maybe that's obvious, but uh, because you want it to be a, a clean white. So I'm going to 
close my black pan pastel so I don't spill it. Open my white. Now I'm going to take my other um, my other knife, but you, if you, if you only have one knife, then you need to change out the pad. And I'm I'm basically going to do the same thing with the white. So I'm just going to. Dip it in um, the white. I'm going to pat it off a little bit. And then I'm just going to block in the light masses. And I'm, gonna, I'm trying to create a drawing where in my drawing, I, I can clearly read the lights of the, the drapery against the dark of the background. So I want to create a drawing where I have a clean, clear sense of lights against darks. Oh, wait, uh, Professor? Yeah. Uh, near the start of the demonstration, you pulled out a piece of tape, like to signify what? What was the, the point of? To the signify tape? the shadow, you know, the, the terminator, the edge of the shadow, and the edge of the cast shadow. In order to see the, the light shadow? Well, I, I, I was just emphasizing that all I was looking at, I wasn't looking at any, anything in between the two pieces of tape other than one unified shadow map. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Oh, by the way, um, Hunter, Hunter, uh, his his mic isn't working. Oh, okay. He, uh, yeah, I just asked the question for him. Okay, hold on. That was his question. Oh, that was his question. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Yep. Yeah, if anybody notices a question in the chat that I'm not noticing, if you, you want to ask me for a classmate or if you just want, to, want to direct my attention to the chat, um, feel free to do that. So I'm blocking in a pretty heavy mass of light um, because I want to, I really want to make that very clear. I want to get that clarity of light against the background. So I am going to be going back into this with the pencils, but this is just a way of blocking in that big first pass. Lights and darks. We're getting the big, big masses blocked in.
So um, who, who mentioned that uh, the Carl Play store was out of it? Was that you, Anne-Marie? Yes. Um, did they say that they normally have it? They're just out of stock? Um, no, I had called because I had, because <laughs> my um, stuff wasn't uh, arriving fast enough. So I was just going to see if I could just get it in, in the store instead. And they said that, yeah, some stores don't carry everything. You just have to type it into the search box and select a store. So um, they didn't have a lot of the items from your list. Um, the only thing they had in stock um, were the pencils and um, the paper. Everything else I had to get from um, online. Did you, you mean including like all the erasers and everything? You didn't get yeah, they didn't even have erasers. Yeah, that's the problem with these chain stores is they often run out. You know, that's New York City used to have great art supply stores. There was this place called. Um, New York Central on 3rd Avenue and 11th Street. It was just a great independently owned art supply store. They, they were virtually never out of things. Of course, sometimes. It was, like, you know, it was a individually run store that catered to artists. But of course, like everything in New York in the past 20 years, you know, that building became so valuable that the family decided to take the 30 million instead of uh, continuing to run an art supply store. Like when the guy who had run it for decades died. So we're losing all of these great independent stores. So now we're stuck with Blick. But they seem to have, um... Blick seems to have on rec on file like the art supply material list for colleges in the area, but they didn't have ours, of course. But I guess like maybe they keep supplies for like those classes that they're like have a I don't know contract with or a connection with because they ask me, oh, what college are you in? I'm like Queens. They're like, oh, we don't have that one. <laughs> well, I mean, there the fault is with me and the other faculty members. We could easily set that up. The only issue with that, though, is that I, I, I mean, I'd have to do it too with a bunch of maybe, maybe it can be centralized with Blick because um, not everyone's going to go to Carl Place. But that's not convenient for everybody. But um, actually, maybe Blick can centralize it. I, I'll. That's my fault. I mean, I've it, I've just never. Well, first of all, we usually just. Um, Order them when we're on campus. We get we buy the materials for students from your materials fee, or most of the materials. Um, but obviously, we can't do that anymore. Or while we're, um, you know, while we are, what, what what's the word I'm looking for? Well, we're not on campus. That wasn't it. But remote. Over the remote, thank you. Um, and by the way, um, Sefi pointed this out in the semester, but you all were charged a material fee. But I did, um, I did go in and make sure that that is being reimbursed. So if you haven't gotten it yet, and you may not have, just because things go slowly, at Queens College, as you all know, um, you will be reimbursed that materials fee. So, um, how, how, again, how are we doing in terms of um, understanding what I'm doing? Does anyone need any of this clarified? Any, any, anyone need any? Does everybody see the way I'm seeing the drapery in, in terms of this simplification of lights and shadows? Are, are you leaving space for the halftone? Are you going to do that in later? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to bring in the halftone. Okay. Um, I'm not leaving space for it. You know, in, in theory, I, that's a good question. In theory, I could do that. Like I could let 
some of the blue of the paper act as the half tone. Right. And I'm not doing that mostly because um, that would be a more time consuming and laborious process. Um, right. And I, I, I don't think, I mean, I don't want to make these demos any longer than they need to be, just because I think I, for understandable reasons, I start to lose people. Um, right. So I'm going to be. So you want us to go edge to edge? Yeah, I like go edge to edge, and then you can um, use the pencils to create the half tones, you know, in a way by blending the lights and the darks. <laughs> Because you, you can do that. You can blend these. Um, you can blend these pastels. I, mean, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with traditional pastel painting, but you can, you know, you can take a red pastel and a green pastel and you can blend them together. Right. You're not getting it brown. You take a white pastel and a black pastel, you end up getting a gray. So we're going to be rendering this by using a combination of this pastel I'm laying in and um, And, and the white and black charcoal pencil. So you want to start getting a situation where in your drawing, your lights glow against the, the value of the background the same way they do here, right? So we're, we're clearly seeing the lights as strongly illuminated Masses of value against a new uh, against the middle tone ground. You do get little um, dusty. You get a little bit of dust from this technique. So if anyone's working in a, I don't know if anyone's working in their dining room and either you or your parents don't want things to get messy, you might want to put down a, you know, something to catch the dust. So tomorrow, um, okay, so uh, for the next two days, the class time will be uh, blocks of time where you should be developing this drawing. Tomorrow at the same time, I'm going to be setting up individual meetings with people. So uh, you should plan on using your class time tomorrow to be working on this drawing and then just sign in with me at your assigned uh, meeting time. Is, is tomorrow like an asynchronous day, like last Monday? Asynchronous, yes. With, yes, asynchronous. And, and we'll be having, each of us will be having, each of you will be having an individual, a scheduled individual meeting with me. Okay. And uh, uh, will you send the schedule like? Yeah, I'll, I'll send the schedule by tomorrow morning. Oh, okay. Perfect. Thank you.
So if this were, you know, if I, again, if I weren't trying to um, be efficient with my time, I would spend a little bit of time cleaning up some of these variations within the lights and darks, just because I, I, I you know, in, in my own work, and this is a personal style choice, I like to develop very um, cleanly rendered images. I'm not gonna do that here, again, because I don't want this demo to take up too much of your time. I'll, I'll do that as I'm working on this. But so there's my block in, my big block in of the light and dark masses of the drapery. So again, I want to ask, does anyone need me to clarify the way I have seen any of these light large masses? So now, again, I've, I've seen the light. Let, let's look at this part of the drapery and this part of my drawing. I've seen the light as this large simplified shape. And I hope people can see that shape there, right? I'm ignoring differences um, between like the very lightest value and the very, and the middle values, I'll put those in. But right now I've just simplified everything into big lights and darks. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. So, you know, don't, again, don't hesitate to ask me to clarify something. So, um, okay, so now, so what's the next step now? So for the kind of drawing I'm asking you to, to do, now, now we're gonna switch back to our charcoal pencils. Um, and we're now going to start the modeling of this form or the rendering of this form by looking, by doing a little bit of cleaning up and then, and, and looking for those elements of light and shadow. So I'm going to go back in and I'm going to work on, I'm going to concentrate on one small area. I'm going to go back in and just start going over my shadow area with the pencil. Now, normally I would be working the totality of this drawing all at the same time. I'm going to concentrate on this area. Just again, so that I can um, demonstrate some of the main principles without having this demo take forever. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on this area in here right now, just to, to show you what I mean by um, going from this simplification to a more, a fuller development. So I'm going to redraw, the first thing I'm going to do is redraw I'm going to redraw my shadow shape. I mean, my light shape, because that went a little bit off. I'm just using my pencil to strengthen the value of that light area.
and I'm going to change, I'm going to slightly change the shape of my dark mass. So I'm just now sort of going back and looking at my shapes and seeing what needs to change and be modified. So the shape of each of those, the light mass and the dark mass just needed to be changed a little bit. So in the, the way the camera's recording or picking up this, the way the camera's seeing these objects, there appears to be more of a curve to the line of light and shadow because of the curvature of the lens. Nevertheless, there is, my, my line of light and shadow is a little bit too straight. It is, it should be curving a little bit more. So I'm going to look for and bring in that curve. So I'm sharpening my charcoal pencil, my white charcoal. So using the same approach as I do with a graphite pencil. You know, this is my studio, so I don't mind the dust dropping to the floor. Again, if you're working at home and you don't want that to happen, you, you, you'll just want to do this sharpening um, someplace, you know, in some way that you can control that, like sharpen it right into a paper bag or something. So again, here, before, before I'm gonna go in and do any of the fine rendering, I'm just going through a process of cleaning, cleaning up my light mass and my shadow mass. So here's a case of, you know, this is what I was referring to earlier where I'm gonna be doing some kind of tedious things. It's just the nature of this kind of drawing. Um, I, I will, I, I will not go in and render this, I mean, or clean it up as finely as I would, was I working on this drawing, um, or if I were working on this drawing on my own. Okay, so now, I have a reasonably 
clean and um, you know a reasonably good shape for that the main light and shadow again in this area which I'm concentrating on right now. Um, so now I'm going to go in and I'm going to start the rendering by looking for those elements of light and shadow that we talked about. So, um, Jalian, what are those elements of light and shadow we're going to be looking for? Jalian, what are those elements of light and shadow we're going to be looking for? Riku, what are the elements of light and shadow we're going to be looking for? Um, the dark areas, I assume. Yeah, and what do we call? What are the dark? What do we call those? Do you remember? Uh, not really sure. Um. And in our, what do we call the darker areas in the shadows? Yun Chung, what do we what do we call those? Anyone remember? Yun Chung, what do we call those darker areas in the shadows? Uh, the cat, cat shadow. And then my arm. Well, there's cat shadow. Uh, so this would be cast shadow. And we're actually seeing a little cast shadow there. But what do we call the very dark part? So the parts where there's no, there's virtually no light hitting or this dark band, what do we call that? The Terminator or the dark mask? Well, dark, this overall is the dark mask. shadow. What did you say? Who is the core player? shadow? That's right. The core shadow. So, yeah. So I, I respect the effect. So I'm going to start looking for the core shadow and the shadow, the, the occlusion shadow, or Um, or the shadow accent. So I can start bringing in some of these. Um, I can start indicating the variations in the value. So the first thing I'm looking for is, are the occlusion shadows. So those darker areas. So I always want to keep my lights, my light and dark masses unified. I, I want them to, to read as distinctly and clearly separate from one another. So in order to do that, I want, again, I want to start with these completely unified uh, areas of light and dark. And then I'm going to go into the dark and start finding those elements of light and shadow that bring out those variations. So now I'm looking for the core of the shadow. So there's this core, this dark band, that core of the shadow that runs up the length of that shadow mass. So I'm looking at, I'm bringing it in, I'm looking at its um, shape, in other words, its width and how much it,
transitions in, or, or the softness or harshness with which it relates to the values around it. In other words, how, how softly or how strongly does it um, transition into the values around it? I'm going to clean up my edge of the light here, the light mass. I'm going to do a little bit of, I'm going to erase away some of the, um, some of the light that I mistakenly put in the dark area here. So again, okay, so now I'm gonna go back and, and bring in, again, this core of the shadow. So we're starting to bring in the core of the shadow here, and then we have core of the shadow reflected light and then the cast shadow behind it. So I'm also gonna bring in the dark of the cast shadow. So we have core of the shadow reflected light and then the darker cast shadow. So just looking at my shadow shape, I think I made this shadow shape a little bit too big.
So starting to pull out light, dark, light and dark, and then core of the shadow, cast shadow. And by putting in the core of the shadow and the cast shadow and the shadow accent, I'm creating the reflected light. So I'm not, I'm not pulling out or going into the shadow mass with um, my with my white charcoal, although maybe in the end I will do a little bit of that. But not doing it right now. I'm just creating that core of, I mean, just creating that reflected light um, by bringing, by darkening around it. Now I am cleaning up a little bit here. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Do people see what I'm seeing? Core of the shadow, reflected light, cast shadow. So I'm starting to bring those in, core of the shadow, reflected light, cast shadow. Do people see that? And do people have any questions about what I'm looking at? So you know, I do want people to start to understand these basic principles of light and shadow. So you should be looking for all those elements in your drawing, bringing those into your drawings. Okay, so again, for the purposes of the demonstration, I'm not gonna belabor this area. I wanna just show some of the, ma the main things I'm looking at. So I'm starting to bring in those elements. Now, I'll also, I, and again, I would work on this longer if this were my own drawing. I'd refine this and clean up some of these. Consistencies, I'd go in and clarify the shape a little bit more. Um, but before I do that, I want to uh, start to talk about the half tone. So, right now in the drawing, we have an abrupt shift from the terminator or the shadow edge into the light, right? We're in our, in the drapery we're looking at, that's a soft transition. We go from light and shadow softly, I mean, from shadow softly into the light. So let me do what I did last week. I'm gonna bring this up a little bit closer. So that you all can see a little bit more what I'm doing. So uh, you're looking at this drapery now from a bit of an angle that's distorting it, but um, so you're not, so you're not, so you're seeing a relatively narrow light it or light plane there, but I, I think it'll be helpful to bring this closer. So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to start turning that edge. So that's a hard edge in my drawing right now, but I'm going to go in with my pencil and just start softening, transitioning that, that edge. So I'm starting to get a turn. So I'm gonna get a soft turn. You know, the way objects roll from the shadows to the lights. You know, and there are some ways of drawing where an artist would go right in with some bigger tool and make that halftone. And 
know, that's a great way to draw. And if that's something you're interested in doing, then I would encourage you to do that. Um, not really in this drawing. This drawing is more about a kind of carefully observed. But I'm certainly not in anything I teach. I'm not saying this is the only way to do something. So I'm starting to, again, I'm starting to turn that form. And I'm going to start at this stage looking for Uh, I'm going to start looking for, you know, the variations that um, make, that are going to make the drapery look like the specific drapery I'm looking at. So any questions about this technique of turning the form? Are you only um, like applying less pressure as you get closer to the, the light mass, like a light shadow? Yeah, I, yeah, it's a, I'm putting, I'm not putting a lot of pressure on the pencil. I'm just sort of letting the pencil like roll over or ride over the lights. And I'm, mm. I'm using the charcoal and blending it with the white charcoal that's already there. <laughs> oh, to make it look like it's rolling. Yeah. Same technique as before, just little circular motions, or should we just go up and down lightly? You know, that's um, that's a question. That's um, that's sort of a a tech a, a sort of personal style technique question. I mean, I am using. If you're interested in what I'm doing here, I'm doing little circular motions. That doesn't mean I always do that, but that's what I'm doing right now. Um, so I do recommend that, but I don't, I don't mean to say that, you know, you could vary that. There are different ways of putting the, putting the tone down, but I, I'm doing little circular motions. And I, I mean, I, I would, I would recommend that just in the sense that it's a good, I think it's a good technique. Yeah, it's preference. Thanks. So I'm going in and cleaning up. The, the light mass. So I'm noticing that little lip of the drapery that down there, start making it look like the drapery I'm looking at. So, and, and I think people can see that without erasing any of the tone within the dark mass. That, that reflected light now that we're bringing the tones around it genuinely seems to be kind of glowing. You know, it has that kind of glow that reflected lights can have. I don't know what made me see this, the uh, cast shadow is so broad in the first block in, but this obviously, that whole shadow shape needs to get narrower. 
don't know how I saw how I so badly misinterpreted that size. Let's go back to my white pan pastel for a second. I was paranoid I'm going to drop one of these things one day. I bet I will. So um, by the way, these drawings are pretty delicate. So this is, th this stuff will wipe off the page much easier than graphite pencil will. So you want to you know, treat these drawings um, carefully, at least you know, while you're working on it. Um, and, and if you do want to keep the drawing after you're done, um, actually you'll probably want to get, um, some fixative for it. Does everybody know what fixative is? No. Fixative, um, it's called spray fixative. And um, you, you can get workable fixative. Uh, I'll send people a link, but fixative is just a spray you put on the drawing that holds that um, material in place. It'll hold the pastel and the charcoal in place. Wor workable fixative is fixative that in theory you're supposed to be able to go in after you fix the drawing and continue like working on it. It, it, it only kind of works. You're not really able to go in back in and work on it. You can a little bit, but not, not in exactly the same way as before you put the fixative on. So now this cast shadow obviously has a much softer transition. So I'm gonna go in now and transition this cast shadow, you know, put in the softening half tone in there. start to indicate half tones in the drawing. Okay, so why don't we take, um, take our mid-class break.
Uh, we'll take a 20 minute break and then we'll come back and you know, finish the part of today's class where um, people should be here. And then again, you're free to sign off. You know, now, I mean, I, I've shown you the basic elements of one blocking in the line drawing, finding, using line to trace out the light and shadow masses, using the white and black pan pastel to block in the big light and dark masses, and now we're engaged in the process of rendering, you know, of, of finally rendering this form. Um, but let's take a break. I know this is getting a little bit um, re repetitive and tedious. We'll take a break and uh, then we'll come back, finish up today's synchronous part of class. And then people have the option, you're welcome to continue watching. I'm gonna, I will stop the first demo at around around the end of class time. Um, I'll, I'll process that video and upload that sometime today. And then I will record myself um, working on the drawing further. Um, so anyway, let's take our break and we will get started again at 1127. Let me just, before people end, I just want to see any questions. Okay. All right. So um, let's let's come back at eleven twenty-seven, and we'll or eleven twenty-eight. We'll start the rest of the um, synchronous demonstration. Okay. Excuse me, professor. Yes. I have some uh, questions about my attendance. Should I approach you now or after class? Uh, yeah, let's talk at the end. Gotcha. Who's this, Hunter? Yes, it is. Well, I got you for today. I saw you ask that question in the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay. There were some uh, some others that I'll, I'll ask later, though. Okay, all right. Hey everybody, um, I open my window because it's getting hot in my studio. I don't have air conditioning. Is, um, I just, if, if it's too loud, if you can't hear me, let me know. Can you all hear me fine? Yep. Yeah. Okay. We can hear you. So, um, yeah, so I, you know, I don't know how, how you know, I think it's, I think, um, you know, sort of the main takeaway of what I want people to know um, about how to approach this drawing, I've already explained. I mean, I, I don't... I don't know how necessary it is for people to continue watching. Like I said, um, I, I'm going to continue working I want to get this as uh, you know as highly developed as I can today. I'm, I, I'm not going to continue working on it beyond today, um, but just so people have an example of what you know, not not some. I, I'm not expecting people to copy what I do, um, 
And that's even though you're not allowed to hand in a copy of my drawing, but um, I want people to get a sense of what I mean by a fully developed rendering. So certainly people are, are welcome to continue watching. Um, you know, as I continue to, to polish this up, is there anything, let me, let me ask, is there anything I can explain to people? You feel like it, in, in, in order to be able to continue working on this, I can explain anything more clearly or would you like me to go into a different part of the drawing and show you anything? Professor, this is Sefi. Um, can I just ask you about the cast shadow to the right of the drapery? Are you going to go and darken it? Because to, to me, it looks like it's significantly darker than the form shadows on the form and the cast shadows on the form. Yeah, I, absolutely. So um, it's just, I just have not gotten to that yet. But yeah, and why don't I, you know, I think that actually, thanks for pointing that out. I think that that might be helpful um, just because it will help set up the full value range. Let me just point out something I'm doing here. So you'll notice that in my drawing, you'll notice that in here, the transition from core of the shadow to reflected light to cast shadow is much softer than in my drawing. So one thing I'm, I'm doing now is just now, since I have core of the shadow reflected light cast shadow, now I'm just softening the transitions between them. I don't want to lose those elements, but I want to start getting the same degree of softness that I see on the drapery. So I'm just softening those transitions, just using that same technique of, you know, like I said, I used to have a teacher who called it tickling the edge. So I'm just sort of going in and, and picking out things that are too dark and then softening the transition between those different elements of light and shadow. How do you soften it without making it too dark? Uh, I don't even think about that anymore. So here's the darker part, right? Here's the lighter part. And so, you know, when, when the transition is too harsh, like let's say up here, the transition is too harsh. I'm not pressing down as dark as that darkest part. I'm just putting in, you know, a delicate sort of smoky tone at the edge. So in softening the transition here, I'm, I, I'm just you know, making sure that that transitional tone stays lighter than the dark. I don't quite know how to explain it verbally better than that. Um, you know, it's just, it's about the touch of the pencil. Does that make sense, Sefi? I'm not sure. Yes, thank you. I, I would go in here and I, I would pick out a little bit of the dark of the core of the shadow. So I'm using my eraser to pick that out because I think I made that a little bit too dark. So, you know, and I, again, I want to emphasize something because I don't want, I don't want to freak out people who don't have a lot of experience with drawing or who's, who, who just because of sensibility just work in a different way. You know, maybe you make work that's more spontaneous, totally fine. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to give the impression that I think everybody has to be able to do this kind of drawing. This is in, in part determined by what the kind of art I, li I like, I like a lot of different kinds of art, but kind of, let's say the kind of art that 
I, am, I myself am inclined to do, at least the way I'm doing this right now. You know, as I've said, I do think that learning these elements of drawing and learning these basic principles of how to build structure and form in a drawing is very widely applicable. But you don't have to do it exactly the way I'm doing it. Um, you know, certainly not going forward in your work as an artist. So I, I don't want to give that wrong impression, or I don't want to give that impression. I, I just think that this is, these are good things to try, you know, as you're trying different approaches to making art. So I'm, again, softening those transitions, and I'm going to, you know, and, and the cast shadow, the edge of the cast shadow is a little bit softer, and you'll notice that the cast shadow, the shape of the cast shadow is a little bit different. So it, it kicks in a little bit, then comes out. So I'm gonna indicate that a little bit better. Um, so, I, you know, I would continue working there on that. Um, okay, so, Seppi, you asked about that cast shadow. Yeah, and that's an important part of the drawing because we want to set up the clarity of the, or, or I want to set up the full range of values and indicating the, the value, the very dark value of that cast shadow is going to be an important part of that. So before I do, before I really put in that dark tone, I'm just going to clarify the edge of the shape, or the edge of the form, just so I know what to bring the cast shadow up to. And now I'll go in and I'm going to, going to um, really darken that cash out. Professor, I have a question. It's Sefi again. Is the terminator, uh, so the terminator on the form shadow looks lighter than the outline of the cast shadow on the form, at least from where I'm sitting. Maybe it's a camera, a trick of the camera. So when you say the terminator, do you mean the core of the shadow? So, so like the second triangle, going from left to right, okay. the second, the second one. Um, 
So when, when I'm looking at it, the cast shadow of that cone shape or that triangle shape. So this is the second triangle. Yeah, that's the second triangle. And now if you move your pencil to the right, where the cast shadow is, yeah, that looks darker than the Terminator line. Yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, it's slightly darker than the Terminator. Okay, just wanted to ask you, okay. Yeah, and eventually, um, no, that's true. I mean, yeah, it's a very subtle difference, but that's true. Yeah, I would, I would go in and do that. I'm using the eraser stick just to, so I can make a little bit more precise or erase out a little bit more, erase out a little bit more of a precise line. So I'm getting my softer charcoal pencil. So um, I was actually, I asked you all to buy an HB. What did I ask you to do? Buy an HB and a 2B? Or did I just ask you to buy an HB? No, it was HB and 2B for the charcoal, the black charcoal. Well, I'm actually, um, I started the drawing using an H charcoal pencil. I, I didn't ask you to buy that because um, General's Charcoal stopped making it during COVID. I, and I don't know if they're gonna continue making them. Um, I just had them, I actually called General's and they were willing to sell me from their stock, but they're not making them anymore. So you can't get them right now. Um, it makes little difference, it's just, using the, that H that I was using, you're able to get a slightly lighter line. But so now I'm going to the, a slightly darker pencil, a slightly softer, um, this HB. Um, if we were to find a, an H uh, charcoal black pencil, do you want us to buy it or it doesn't matter? That's up to you. You don't No, I'm not asking you to buy it. I mean, oh, certainly okay. if you're interested enough, it might be a good thing to experiment with. Okay. But I, I really, I don't think they're making them. I, I still think they're not making them. Only for generals or like in general? I don't think, to be honest with you, I don't think there's any other company that makes charcoal pencils in these different gradations. Oh, okay. Yeah, general seems to sort of dominate the market. Um, I actually do not even, I don't have a 2B. Sure. I don't. Okay. Professor, are we pretty much like free to use kind of like a large range of materials for this? Um, because you, you've already used like five or six different types of pencils, you know, pan pastel, all that stuff. So are we kind of free to experiment with that too? Well, what would you, what would you add? I have um, darker uh, graphite, like or softer, rather softer graphite um, pencils and softer charcoal. I just like had it in a pack and I'd like to use them. What, what kind of charcoal specifically? 
it's not fine charcoal. It is charcoal pencils. They're just like softer. I don't know what the gradation is, but I think it's softer than, yeah, than what we were using. But it's charcoal pencil? Yeah. Yeah, you just want to avoid for this, you want to avoid any kind of um, charcoal that's waxy. You know, that has okay. like a waxy binder because those are not going to mix. Do okay, know, got it. That? Yeah, I do. Any kind of waxy or oily binder. Because they okay. um, you know, normally I say um, that you can't mix graphite and charcoal, but I, I have a friend who does these beautiful drawings and he mixes graphite and charcoal, so I guess if people wanted to try that, um, you could. All right, thanks. Yeah, I mean, and, and thanks for asking that question because um, actually something that, like I, you know, this sounds stupid being the teacher, but, you know, I just mentioned that I, I, I just looked for a 2B pencil and somehow I don't have one. I certainly have them at one time. Um, but I, but this, this HB is, is not quite up to the task. This is a little bit too light to really lay in that dark tone. Um, so I should have, you know, I should have a darker pencil for that. Here's actually, I, I mean, I didn't ask people to buy this. This is a Conte pencil. And Conte is a little, it's kind of like charcoal. So anyway, this is a, this is a softer, This is a softer pencil. So, yeah, now this is, I might have got myself in trouble here because Conte is a little bit, um, Conte is a little bit waxier, slightly waxy. I think actually this will mix. I would, I'm doing this just for the sake of getting this done relatively quickly for the demo. I would recommend if you want to go with darker drawing implements, go with darker charcoal, not Ponte. Because I'm not totally confident in how this is going to work out in terms of mixing. Again, I just want to do this to start giving a sense of pushing that cast shadow down, um, you know, making that value really dark. And um, I, obviously I would extend that out and then I'm going to start softening that edge. So the cast shadow has that soft edge.
So as you're working on this drawing, you know, this kind of approach to drawing where you're really trying to look at and, and get the values that are up on the setup, um, you know, it can be, it's often very different from the way you may have drawn before. And so, You know, it, it, it may be something you're inclined to not really stick with. You know, so again, if we think about our classes when we're not remote, we're all working in the studio, where sometimes we do things in the studio, we're, we, we're doing a technique that we're not familiar with and we're not really comfortable with. And maybe if you weren't there in the studio, you know, under the pressure of, or the expectation of, participating in the entirety of the class. If it weren't for those conditions, you wouldn't stick with whatever it is you're doing. And I, I mean, I've certainly had that experience as an art student. But then once you finish it, you go through the process, you, you realize how much you've learned and you're glad you did that, like whether you continue to do that or not. You know, part of the, the challenge for you all in doing these classes remote is you have to sort of self-motivate to do that. And, and I just want to, you know, really encourage people to try to approach the other side. You know, give yourself three and a half hours tomorrow, three and a half, half hours on, on Wednesday, and really commit yourself to, like, trying to complete a drawing like this. You know, even if it doesn't exactly conform your sensibility and it's a little bit of an arduous task, try to make yourself do it so that you, you know, just learn what can be learned through this process. So I mentioned smudging um, with graphite, which I don't want people to do. Once you're at a stage like this with charcoal, you can go in with one of these, they're called blending stops, and you can blend. If you want to use this to integrate and unify the tone, you can do that if you desire. Uh, you want to avoid blending with your fingers because when you blend with your fingers, you put down grease, you know, just body grease uh, onto, into the paper. And it, it can create stains and it can interfere with what the material um, can do. But you can use blending stumps successfully uh, with charcoal and um, pastel. So if people want to do that, um, you're welcome to do that. These are again, tools that you, I mean, these, you, you know, you should be able to get these at an art supply store. Although the last time I went to Blake to get them, they were out. So, um, you know, it's not required, but it's something you can do. Are there any tools that we have like at home around us that we could like well, mimic a blending stump if we don't have one? A blending stump, the advantage of a blending stump is it's somewhat precision, right? It's like sharpened like this. Um, you can, they also make these blending stumps, it's kind of real quick. You can do it with, um, you know, you can do it with like paper towel. How about a Q-tip? Yeah, maybe. Actually, I have Q-tips, let's try that. I 
having no words. Yeah, Q-tip, that's a good idea. Uh, so you can do that with charcoal. Now, you don't want to put down a little bit of charcoal and then like take the blending stump and like try to spread that over your whole page. You want to get most of your work down with the drawing tool and then use the blending stump to merge all those tones together. So I have to give a little bit of edge to that. So again, you want most of your, your charcoal to be down already. You know, I could go in here and now that most of the stuff is in there, I can just give that a little bit of just a little bit of a turn. So we've looked at those drawings by Pierre Paul Proudhon, those um, highly rendered figure drawings on blue paper. He, he would use a, a blending stump. And then he would go back in over it with those little lines we talked about last week, those directional lines. I think I, I'll just officially say here that um, I, at this point, certainly people can sign off if you want. Um, you know, I, I would certainly recommend using the rest of class to start getting your stuff together, get your setup going so that you have um, your setup to work from tomorrow and Wednesday. Um, again, anyone who chooses to stay on, totally fine. Um, cause I, I'm going to continue working, uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer them and I'm going to keep recording and I will post these videos on Blackboard so that you can refer to them if you feel like you need to. Um, so any questions about anything? All good. Thank you, professor. Okay. Okay, so I'll keep working and just, you know, if, if anyone's staying on, um, you want to ask me anything, feel free. I will just say it right now, since I'm not specifically showing um, specific techniques, I, I'm going to I'm going to now go over the whole thing and start cleaning it up, clarifying the big simplification before going any further in um, any kind of small rendering. Okay. So in order so that I can give a best sense of that, I'll pull this back. Oh, Professor, you said uh, tomorrow will be our asynchronous uh, right. session. Tomorrow will be asynchronous. I'm, I'm going to have individual meetings set up. Okay. So refer to the schedule for individual meetings. And you um, said you'd send the email by tonight or tomorrow morning? Send it by tomorrow morning. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Have a good one. Okay. Professor, we're working off the same schedule that we had for the first uh, critiques. Yeah, I think so. Unless anyone really needs a different time. I, um, Otherwise, I think it, it's just easier for me to just send it to everybody. 
does that work for you? Yeah, no, it, it works for me. I just wanted to make sure so that I have it in my head. I actually, Professor, need a different time. Uh, who is that? Anne Marie. I have my class that I teach at 1220, and my uh, time was at 1229. Uh, okay, can you, um, do you mind just sending me an email to remind me? Sure, no problem. Thank you.
you know, to, to P, if anyone's still here, let's see. Yeah, for anyone who's still here, um, I just changed, I was working with a darker pencil than this H that I started with. Because that pencil, like, for some reason it wasn't, it wasn't making really marks on the paper. Um, sometimes you get a charcoal pencil like that, that somehow, doesn't quite work, so I just stopped using that pencil. Not sure why that happens. So I'm just changing the shape of this shadow edge. So that shadow edge there was a little bit too straight before. So you notice how this shadow edge has a little like a slight S curve to it. So I'm trying to get that in. So I'm erasing some of my dark. I'm gonna go, go back in some of the white. Thank you. 
So I'm, just, I'm picking out, um, I'm using my kneaded rubber eraser to pick, to pick out um, little, little patches of dark within, um, within the unified areas of shadow, just to give it a, a little bit of a cleaner initial value. So the eraser sort of barely touching the surface of the drawing. Just picking up any of the little excess charcoal. I'll do that throughout. Now just uh, clarifying that shape a little bit. I think like the shape of my
shape of the drapery as it approaches the top of the form was a little bit off. So again, um, or I don't know if I should say again, I'm just looking at something here. I'm point, gonna point something out. So you'll notice on 
the drapery. This, notice how that, that shape of the drapery comes to a kind of point here, right? Because of the way the drapery was cut and the way it turns around in space. My drapery doesn't quite come to that point, right? It, it turns more, there's more of a, a clearly discernible turn. And I was about to change this so that it looked more like that. But I actually, I'm gonna keep this. And the reason I'm gonna keep this is I think that that curve to the drapery gives mo more of a sense of that drapery turning around in space. If I draw it like that, with that, with that kind of right angle shape, that's gonna have the appearance of the kind of right angle corner of a piece of paper. So it's not gonna be, not gonna appear to turn around in space so much. So I'm gonna keep it like this. And that's, um, you know, that type of thing where you're interpreting what you're looking at and not always just copying. Um, even when we're trying to make a very, a very finely observed, finely rendered drawing, you wanna make those changes or you always want to change um, what you're looking at when it serves um, the, the creation of volume and space. So this is a, a pretty bright reflected light. So I am gonna, I'm gonna remove a little bit of my charcoal. I think I let my charcoal get a little bit too dark in there. So I'm gonna just take some of that out. I'm not erasing back to the value of the paper, but I am just taking some of that charcoal out and I'll, I'll use the needed eraser to sort of draw. I'm gonna draw with the eraser. So as I'm removing that charcoal, I'll, 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 I'll remove the charcoal almost like I'm putting in little strokes of a pencil. Just pick a little bit of that up. Now that I'm doing that, I'm not happy with the shape of that shadow. I'm not quite getting that right. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Just that a little bit.
right now taking out a little bit of the, just removing a little bit of the white chalk from that area, just because this plane, as you can see here, is much lighter. This plane underneath. I'm going to remove some of that. So I'm now um, using my white charcoal or white chalk and going in and cleaning up the big masses of light, just making them a little bit more unified. And I'll do this through uh, clarifying shapes.
Okay, um, I don't know if anyone's still on, but I'm going to end um, the first uh, se first demo here. Uh, I just need to take a break from working on this. Um, and then I'm going, as I said, I'm going to continue working on this today, and I will record that and post that. But I'm going to end the morning class and end the first um, demo here. Does anyone have any questions, if anyone's still on? No, Professor. OK. Yeah, uh, regarding my attendance, I wanted to speak about that earlier. Sure. So um, yeah, so um, any other questions? OK, so if everyone else would, um, if you wouldn't mind signing off so I can just talk to Hunter. And I'll Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Okay. It, it's only a quick question. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you got my text last week that uh, I was going to miss class last Thursday. Yeah, I got it. Sorry, I didn't know. Okay. That's fine. No, it's okay. I just wanted to make sure that you saw it. Okay, good. Okay. I still uh, did the assignment for that day and uh, and for this day, though. I just wanted to make sure if you got those assignments. Yeah, I got them. Okay, thank you so much. All right, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.